I've, I've spoken to a professional person uh, who has told me that uh, the, what was happening to me there was what they describe as um, a, a pre-meltdown penultimate. These are perhaps the last haunting words of director Damien Coburn, the director of the film Tropic Thunder. A film that, like a cinematic Titanic, was doomed to sink, taking with it its cast and crew before it had even come ashore on the shores of American cinema. War. A theme that has inspired countless directors and Hollywood productions. But what is war? What does it mean to take another man's life? Is war murder or institutionalized genocide? What is it in our nature that compels perfectly rational human beings to kill one another? None of these questions interested me. What interests me is making a documentary about the making of a film that led to its own unmaking. Hello. I am documentary filmmaker Jan Jürgen. For many years, I have been fascinated by that most magicalist of all places, Hollywood. As a boy growing up in Wiesbaden, Germany, I would go to the cinema and marvel at the larger-than-life film gods on the silver screen. Mark Hamill, James Garner, and of course Barbara Hershey. But I also remember thinking to myself, is there a more forbidding, more sinister side to Hollywood than the lies perpetuated by the studio system? Of course, these are the questions of a child. But that question still lingers to this day. Last year, I was asked to document the making of a Vietnam War classic called Tropic Sunder. What you are about to see is as unflinchingly as possible a look at the making of a Hollywood nightmare. My nightmare, Tropic Thunder. In the fall of 2007, renowned Broadway theater director Damien Coburn was shooting one of the most expensive Vietnam War movies ever made. Costing well over 300 million and filming on location in Vietnam, Tropics Under boasted one of the most unlikely casts of all time. Well, of course we're going to get out of fucking life! What do you think I'm a dick? Perhaps cracking under the pressure of blockbuster filmmaking, Damien and his cast suddenly and mysteriously disappeared. Rumors abound as to the whereabouts of Hollywood actors Tug Speedman, Jeff Thunder. Studio head Les Grossman refuses to finance additional search efforts, saying, quote, I've spent all the money I'm going to spend on this film. But what actually happened to the cast and crew of Tropic Thunder? To answer these questions, we must take a journey not just into the heart of the conflict that was the Vietnam War, but also a journey into madness. In 2005, Damien purchased the rights to an obscure memoir called Tropic Thunder, written by retired army sergeant and Vietnam veteran John Fourleaf Tabak. Fourleaf, named such because of his incredible luck in battle, was the platoon sergeant of an elite hand-picked group of soldiers codenamed Tropic Xander. Sent on a suicide mission behind enemy lines, the men of Tropic Xander never returned. However, Fourleaf miraculously survived and single-handedly completed the mission. But in the process, he lost every single hand. Veered studio head Les Grossman, chairman and CEO of a Magicorp, sensing a commercial success, snapped up the option on the script. He wanted to go into production immediately. <laughs> Virtually overnight, Grossman lavished over 140 million American dollars on the film. Flush with cash, Damien's confidence seemed to grow exponentially in proportion to the new budget. How would you describe yourself directorially? I often get asked this question, and uh, I think the most succinct way to describe myself is to say I'm 50% Werner Herzog, 50% Hal Ashby, and 50% Peter Bogdanovich. Yes, but that's a hundred and fifty percent. Yeah, I guess it is. With sets built and a crew in place, Damien began casting the film. 
The first actor to be cast was the reclusive Australian method actor and notorious bad boy from Down Under, Kirk Lazarus. No doubt because of his award cachet, Grossman offered him the lead. Every day that I wake up, I thank my father for being an abusive alcoholic because it was that exact kind of environment that I find makes great talent. Lazarus' total commitment to past roles had been borderline unnerving. While in Ireland, preparing to play the gay priest in Satan's Alley, he was once found circumcising an adult male behind a pub in Belfast. However, Lazarus, who had claimed there were no acting challenges left for him, shunned the part of Four Leaf, insisting instead to play the Black Sergeant, Lincoln Osiris. In preparation, Lazarus went to extraordinary and controversial lengths when he had his skin surgically altered in a Singapore clinic. The result, however, was simply astonishing. He was a virtual carbon copy of the original man. During pre-production, we visited him on several occasions. Never once did he drop character. But you gotta walk a mile in a man's shoes. That's what I did, I walked a mile in the shoes, these shoes right here. You know, these old uh, 1970-some espadrilles, that's what you gotta do. There's a myriad of black actors we could have cast, but that's what, that's what people do. What the actors you were thinking? The, the list is endless. Denzel Washington. Sidney Poitier. I could go on. Damien seemed blind to the pitfalls of casting a white actor to play the part of an African-American. We talked about whether it was racist or not. And we, we, we came to the conclusion that it definitely isn't racist. So that was reassuring. Yeah. With race no longer an issue, Lazarus demanded to have the actual family of the real Sergeant Osiris flown from Galveston, Texas, all the way to Vietnam. His commitment to the role was breathtaking. It's working. It's working. Back in LA, Les Grossman and his producer Rob Slalom continued their search for the role of Four Leaf. Smelling a bargain, their top choice was action colossus Tug Speedman. Speedman's Scorcher franchise had grossed over $3.4 billion worldwide. However, Speedman's fee, which used to be $25 million a picture, had fallen sharply to just under $5 million. Here we go again. Again. The reason? Several failed attempts to expand his appeal to audiences. Simple Jack, the story of an intellectually challenged horse whisperer, was a nauseating and cloying attempt not just to win awards, but also respect in Hollywood. I like when we touch heads. He desperately needed to revive his anemic career. Many people questioned whether Speedman had the intelligence to tackle the complexity of such a role. You've been cast as the role of Foley. What is it about this American hero that made you so desperate to play this part? It's an interesting uh, exploration of the American um, American thing. And then one more question, please. Thank you, thank you. Will you be growing your hair out for the role? Speedman got the part. The next role to be cast was the part of Fats. Again, Grossman inserted himself into the process by inexplicably casting celebrity train wreck and known drug addict Jeff Portnoy, a man-child who had made millions on his ability to make himself fart on command. Portnoy first became known to American audiences in his hit television series, Heat Vision and Jack, where he played a maverick genius astronaut whose best friend was a talking motorcycle. Knowledge is power. For real. His fame went global when he began starring in a string of prepubescent teenage fart comedies such as Fart Club and his flagship franchise, The Fatties. Portnoy's frequent and dazzling public meltdowns didn't seem to matter one bit. Fix it! Don't. His run-ins with the law, drunk driving convictions, and his continued intravenous drug problems made him a risk. Ah! He was virtually uninsurable. Damien, obviously devastated by Grossman's hideous casting choices, seemed determined to remain optimistic. But we got a lot of them. We got uh, Little Bo Peep. Oh. We got uh, Commando. <laughs> uh, there's also Holly Golightly. Uh-oh. 
I'm sitting upwind, as it were. <laughs> I'm so sorry I, about so that. So I don't get it. No, it's, it's just the wind sometimes changes direction. I just Let me go this way. Yeah. It's still looping around and hitting me in the face. In their search for guaranteed box office success, Imagicorp's nonsensical casting choices continued. I was puzzled yet again when I overheard Damien bragging about casting Al Pacino for the role of Motown, the black 19-year-old from Detroit. I later learned they were casting the rapper, Al Pacino, singer of the hit single, I Love the Pussy. Say hello to my little friend! <laughs> in his ideal with the Magic Corp, he was also promised product placement in the film for his line of bust and nut energy bars and booty sweat energy drinks. Not working with Tug Speedman, all of them. Thank you, Les Grossman, for giving me the job. With Mr. Chino now playing Motown, there was just one person left to cast. Brooklyn. Snatching the role was a complete unknown. Kevin Santusky, his only credit to date was a surprisingly touching pharmaceutical commercial for a teenage erectile dysfunction medication called Promnite. Five days away from the first day of shooting and with his platoon finally in place, Damien's frustrations began to mount. In an effort to encourage realism and a close bond with the actors, Damien had arranged for a five-day survival boot camp with Gulf War veteran Drake the Stick Longwood. Sadly, only Sandusky was eager to attend. Oh, oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. Sorry, sorry, Damien, I'm sorry. You better be fucking sorry, because you're fucking dead. Uh, dude, I, get down and give me fucking 50. Can I take over? Oh. Okay. Down, 50. motherfucker, and yeah. do him. Do, 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 do what he says. Okay. Dude, who the fuck are you? Oh, I'm the director. Oh, God no. Oh, oh, God. The boot camp experience itself seemed to be an omen of things to come. Finally, the first day of filming had arrived. Damien spent the whole night prior putting the finishing touches on the script. He arrived on set in fantastic spirits. The choppers had landed, the effects team was in place, the camera was ready. Everything was going swimmingly. Everything except for the actors. Lazarus refused to even acknowledge Damien's presence unless he was wearing fatigues. Sandusky, perhaps traumatized by the boot camp, was acting erratic. Al Pacino refused to leave us alone, believing we were a crew from MTV. Is that MTV? No, no, no. That's MTV? Hell hey, yeah, hey, yo, let's do a big shout out, man. Hey, check this out, man. Yo, it's your boy Al Pacino doing it real big. You know how we do it. The same deal every day on my new movie, Tropic Thunder. You know how we do it, baby. He continually hectored us, looking for free publicity. Bam! Booty sweat, Al Pacino's booty sweat is coming at you, yo. And Portnoy, sadly, was clearly and actively still abusing narcotics. You come get him! Worst of all, Speedman had yet to even step foot outside his trailer. Work came to a virtual standstill. Finally, Damien was pressed to do something about it. He's a, he's a, fuck, he's a cunt. It's fucking $200,000 fucking breakfast. This is, uh, ain't gonna be pretty. Ain't gonna be pretty. Hey! What's going on? No, just, uh, just, just dropping by. Make no. sure the, the captain's, uh... Ship shape. Mm. Mm. And what is that? Desperate Housewives. All oh, right. <laughs> Have you ever seen this show? I, no, I heard about it. It's, uh, it's, it's fucking people. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. My girlfriend got me hooked. Are you ready? You were kind of. That's yeah. I'll be, I'll be right out. Okay. I'll be right out. All Good. Right. And hey, get me that Desperate Housewives because I'm sure you want it. I'm, I'm, I'm hooked, hooked now. You Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm only watching it two minutes. And I'm freaking hooked. You're gonna hate me. I hate you if you don't turn up with the shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fuck. Yeah, it's just, uh, no, I think, um, as David said to Goliath, I think we understand each hey. other. Are you guys doing, uh, the, 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 the Survivor the... here something? No. Season one? No. Call me oh, right. Jones and for two. Okay. Don't hate me. I don't. Yeah. Get it. It's like Big Brother or something. After several more hours of waiting, Speedman finally emerged to commence work. Keep rolling and go! However, when cameras rolled, it became apparent that he had yet to learn any of his lines. To all present, it was clear that to press on would be madness. Lazarus seemed to be at breaking point. Man, this is crazy. Okay. Give me all day. Oh, look at you, fucked up again. All right, hot shot. By four o'clock, Speedman had cost production close to $1.6 million. Also, 
behind the scenes, the cultural differences between the Vietnamese and the American crew were beginning to bubble over. Nowhere was this cultural divide more clearly illustrated than in the mind of the film's special effects and stunt coordinator, Cody Keith Underwood. Well, what was this place like uh, before you came here? Was it? Uh... Oh, this place was incredible. I mean, this is, a, this is an animal sanctuary here, first off, and I, I believe it's sacred land. The brush was thick and the wildlife was thick, so it took us maybe, I don't know, six, seven days basically to just get that shit out of here and just get it ready for what we're doing. You know, something like that right there, I'm not trying to be dirty, but that kind of stuff, honestly, it makes, gives me almost of a boner because it's just like, there's Mother Nature who's obviously way bigger than we are, but here's how we take a little piss on Mother Nature's face right here. And it's just this, I mean, this is how we show that we're human, you know? I mean, it's our instinct to just fucking crack at it, just to beat her in her little mouth. You know, look at that, that's beautiful, you know? I don't know how long those trees have been growing for, but look what I'm fucking doing to them. You know, I win. I, I just beat nature today. What had happened to the themes of courage, heroism, and the arrogance of America's foreign policy? In fact, almost uniformly, people seemed indifferent to the subject matter altogether, making idiotic statements that from a PR perspective would most certainly do more harm than good. The only difference between this film and Vietnam is that with this film, we're going to win. Day two started off even worse than day one. Adding to the tension, the actual man, Four Leaf Tayback, had traveled to Vietnam for the first time in 30 years, with the express purpose of advising Speedman on his POW scene. I was just sitting down to interview Four Leaf when my producer, Froderick, slipped me a note. Tug Speedman wanted to participate in the interview. It was the first time Tug had willingly sat down in front of my lens, and I was happy to accommodate. It was also the first time the two men had met. It's been extremely difficult to learn how to use the hooks. I've gotten up to uh, espresso. <laughs> Four leaf. How hard has it been since you've lost your hands? <sighs> when I lost these, it was like I saw through these for the first time. And then I began to realize that I had never really used these. And I'm trying to explain to him that he has to use something in ah. himself somewhere. Gotta find another coffee. This guy, I mean, it's like he's a Buddha or something. Want to rub his belly for luck? Shortly after I turned off my camera for these interviews, some alarming news came over the wire. A tropical typhoon was threatening the coastline and was projected to slam hard somewhere into Southeast Asia. By morning, the threat of typhoon had become more dire. The first signs of what was to come began to show themselves. Despite this, Damien, whipping his crew onward like sled dogs, demanded work continue. But by noon, the situation was hopeless for the film. Speedman fled to Hollywood in his private plane. Lazarus, again refusing to drop character, chartered a Z-130 cargo plane to airlift himself, his fake family, and thankfully myself and crew back to his fake real hometown of Galveston, Texas. It was here that we chose to ride out the storm. But the storm, it seemed, had come to Texas with us. Oh, I heard that. Lazarus, more than ever, did not seem himself. He was acting erratic, refused to sleep, and was suffering explosive outbursts. I'm fucking king of the mountain! You're crazy. I'm crazy! Holy shit. Now what? Something yeah. was terribly wrong. What we're seeing is an acute form of PPSD. I've never heard of this. I'm sorry, uh, post-platoon stress disorder. The first documented case was Charlie Sheen. And when you have an actor, uh, like Mr. Lazarus... Hold on, don't move, we cool. What? It would be unusual if he didn't suffer from this disorder. I give you life! I give you them clothes! Them fucking chips! That's on me too, baby! It's all my shit! I'm running shit! The same diagnosis had been given out to Colin Farrell after Tigerland, Jim Caviezel after Thin Red Line, and incredibly even Robin Williams after shooting Good Morning Vietnam. 
I was grateful at the end of it when we were able to return to the madness of Vietnam. Upon our return to Southeast Asia, I was stunned. Total devastation. All the sets had been smashed like children's toothpicks and an entire battlefield was washed down the Mekong River. In just under two weeks and five days of shooting, the production had lost almost $240 million. All they had to show for it was several discombobulated scenes and a script that was in tatters. Les Grossman, in a rage, called the accountant to say he was pulling the plug the following morning. With such an impossible deadline, there was little hope in reviving the film. Later that night, however, in a brilliant move, Damien did something that was both politically savvy and economically feasible. He courageously chose to shoot the most heartbreaking and moving scene in the script. It was Speedman's monologue. Set at night and in a trench, Fourleaf, knowing his men aren't being led to the slaughter, is faced with the task of urging his men not just to fight, but to fight bravely and to the death. If Damien could pull it off, Les Grossman would certainly see the film's Oscar potential and loosen the purse strings yet again. Damien seemed calm. The mood, by contrast, was thick with anticipation. Paul Leaf comes in and talks to them, almost like a Christ-like figure, if I, could, if I could say that. Yes, you can. Well, he's almost like a Christ-like figure then. I said it. There's a wonderful speech where he says, death is but a moment. Cowardice is a lifetime of affliction. And the idea of death being a moment is just both terrifying and yet strangely comforting. Just uh, be discreet. He knows that you may be coming. So, I'm gonna... Okay, you don't mind the guys that are just covering this whole thing, so... Wow. Reality yeah. show. Reality yeah. show. I wanted to so, talk to you. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I'm about to speak. Hey, no. shoot, shoot. Daddy. I just was wondering if maybe you could give some of the lines I got to some of the other guys. Because mm. it feels a little bit like, I don't know, it's a little bit talky, you know? Mm. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it's, 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 there's a lot of words there, but... Um, I'd like you to say, death springs not from darkness. Yet be not afraid, gentlemen, for hope is its handmaiden. Do not fear death, for death is only a moment. Cowardice is a lifetime of reflection. That's what I'm saying. For me, I know what my audience understands, okay? They don't understand words like affliction and cowardish. Cow it's cowardice. Um, but what does it's, that mean? It's, it's, cowardice. It's, what, what do you mean? It's, it's Is that like a female coward or something? Well, cowardice. It's cowardice. Cowardice. It's I C E ice. Okay, but do you understand the fact that we're even having this conversation? I, know. I already went to get popcorn and take a piss. <sighs> Boy. Um, you know, I think it should be just like, you know, look, we're going out there, right? Mm. We're gonna we're gonna like kick some ass, right? So it should be like, tomorrow's gonna suck. So suck up and deal. Cock the gun. Don't say it, do it. Maggots. Over and out. High five. Don't say it, do it. I... Over and out. I don't, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. Over and out? I mean, That's I what mean, you say on a walkie-talkie when you finish talking. talking. No, sorry, excuse me, sorry. No, I know what it means. I know, no, I know what over and out means. Uh, yeah, that's sorry. like something everybody knows. The following morning, after a fruitless night of shooting, Damien had become uncooperative. I don't care no more. You're part of the machine. You think you're outside the machine. You're part of the machine. You're part of the machine. You think you're outside it, but you're part of the machine. You're part of the machine. You think you're outside it, but you're not. You're part of the machine. Deal with it, dude. I don't give a shit, so... He seemed to be almost totally unhinged. Shoot that! Shoot that! Put that ass as an attachment and send it as an email to Les Grossman. Good night, Vienna. Within moments of this exchange, word came down that Les Grossman had pulled the plug. So it's, uh, it's finally over. It's not over. This is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. These cryptic words would come back to haunt me. In what would be my final interview with him, it was clear that something inside of Damien had completely shattered. I am in a place now which is, um, is a in a place of total clarity. 
I, I don't I don't feel anger, I feel just love, perhaps. Feel yeah, I feel love. I don't bear any kind of resentment. Resentment or ill will. I'm calm, so that I'm sort of at one with yourself. Yeah, let me fucking finish. You're interrupting me, Jesus. <sighs> anyway, I'm feeling better. Damien was anything but feeling better. Early the next morning, roused from my slumber, I received urgent and terrible news. What is it? What is it? Damien and the cast had gone missing. What? The greatest fear of every documentarian is that they themselves will become their own subject, but with these new developments, I had no choice. I leapt into action and hatched an action plan. Find Damien and the cast. They were last seen boarding a chopper that had flown in a northwesterly direction into one of the most lethal and dangerous parts of Southeast Asia. We had many kilometers to cover and the jungle would be unforgiving. However, by nightfall, we had made faint signs of progress. We've just come across this, which appears to be uh, some blood. I'm going to touch it. Don't like touching things that are dirty, but I'm going to. Yeah, that's blood. Going to try it. Yes, that blood tastes like iron. Two more hours we trekked through the jungle, and just when we were about to turn ourselves back, we came across the most tantalizing piece of evidence so far. Looks like a video recorder. There's a tape inside. This is very exciting. I returned to the hotel with bits in my stomach, eager to play the tape. Damien was indeed on the tape, and so were the rest of the actors. But also, there was something so shocking and so awful that I questioned whether my eyes were actually lying to me. Worst of all, it had actually happened to human beings. The thought that people had experienced this made me question life, God, humanity, and the point of living. For several weeks after shooting, I even became suicidal. This is probably the single most disturbing and awful and disgusting thing I've ever seen committed to film. I'm going to watch it one more time. Let's go and make the greatest war movie ever! Yeah! Yeah! yeah. 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 Oh. And watched it again, I did. But what is important is not the amazing footage which you will never see, but instead the lives of the actors who tried to make Tropic Thunder. I will remember them as the human beings they were, not the grotesque pieces of human remains they became. What is it that drove Damien to the edge of lunacy? Why did the cast sabotage itself? And finally, what about Hollywood, the land of false promises? What is the answer to all these questions? I will never tell you. What I have shown you is in the end, the truth. Not this spoon-fed Hollywood version of it. This time, unlike Hollywood, you must decide for yourselves what is real and what is illusion. But be warned, you may find yourself a prisoner to Hollywood and its torrential reign of madness. That's how Central G red hand steady on a bloody machete. Devil is on my shoulder. Should I kill it? Hell yeah! I sliced Jack, took an axe, and gave that bitch chill 40 wax. With my hip hop, it don't stop till heads roll off the cutting block. 